29 of 33. So we're almost complete here. And it's interesting because, and I'm sure I'm running, by the way. Um, most people, I realize, start with their story. Um, and then they kind of weave in the teachings and what they're here to offer. And I've kind of done it differently in that I've, I've really kind of, from the gate, brought a lot of things into your world and into your field. Um, everything from the protector to ascension chakras to just the parts reality in general. And then the last couple of days with Kalena and Gabriel, we've been focusing on the feminine and the masculine, which is a whole treasure trove of things to explore, um, plus the medicine. So uh, there's a lot. And I felt today, and I was actually prompted by Raphael, who, um, as my mate, tends to really support me in my, my story and has been through so much of it with me. And he was just encouraging me to share more about my story and my experiences. So I thought I would do that today, and I feel like it will connect for you the pieces I've been offering and teaching maybe give you more of a sense of the background um, that I come from. And more of my story is especially in um, Keep Waking Up. It's, it's woven into all of my books, so you can go there as well. Plus, I'm going to be reissuing a book that talks about my experience as a seeker and my experience in the group I'm going to talk about it's called Under the Blurred Banyan, and it'll be in the next few weeks available. So if you'd like to receive a free copy, three, free PDF of that, you can email us at soulfulhearts at gmail.com. And you can also email us to receive my latest book, Bliss Mess, at the same email, and we will send it to you. So it's interesting in telling your, your own story, uh, especially for me, because I, because of the parts work, you really, you really go back, back, into these scenes, and you heal so much of what happened that it, it can feel really distant, um, even in, even in that you've experienced it. It, it really doesn't feel like you have. Um, but the main aspect of my, this is really my story as a seeker, and. I, I'm really coming to be clearer that I was never all that anchored in 3D reality. Um, that I always tended to, um, I talk, I've talked about it before, I really go into these imaginative landscapes and playscapes. And, you know, when, when you're young, everybody plays together. And so that was normal. And I was often leading the play. I was leading the scenarios. And then I was also an only child, so I had this coveted, treasured time when I got home from school until my parents would come home, and this was my play time. And that continued all the way into adulthood. It was my, I would spin out, my third eye would create these scenarios, and they would feel very real to me. And often they would be positive scenarios to try to make myself feel better and to teleport me somewhere else. So I would be you know, a rock star in front of a big concert, or I could actually duplicate scenes in movies, or, or I could feel the textures. Um, I actually wondered if I was meant to be an actor, but I was too self-conscious. Parts of me had too much unwillingness about my appearance to pursue that path, or I might have. Um, I could feel these landscapes so viscerally, and I believe this is an aspect of my third eye being open and awakened when I came, when I came here, when I incarnated here. So um, it wasn't, in my early 20s, I explored some mushrooms and LSD with Chris, who was Gabriel. Um, we met when we were 18 and 19. And um, I really enjoyed that. That was an altered state where the defenses came down. It wasn't so much for me about hallucinating. I never took all that much. 
I just took enough to feel altered and then I, I would get into these very deep conversations with people. And this is like at 18 and 19 years old. And I loved that feeling of, of diving in and going in somewhere deep with somebody. And I love that, that sense that the walls, the defenses were dropped, right? And I, I, went, I was going to school, I was going to college to become a psychiatrist, actually. And I wanted to work with um, schizophrenics and the more extreme cases. And then when I, I think the taking these drugs really awakened me actually to my healer and realizing that this would be years of school and it would be very um, pharmaceutical. And there's just something in my soul that that didn't work. And I ended up dropping out. And eventually in the medical field. And I spent five years as a medical assistant nurse. Um, mostly half of that time actually in an oncology center, a cancer center, radiation oncology. And um, that was very intense. <laughs> And I was young, with a young daughter at that time. And I really feel that it was my healer that enjoyed helping people and making them feel better, bringing positivity to them. Um, I also actually, my soul was so familiar somehow with life and death. So that environment, I, I worked in just a primary care office for a while, but that environment of the cancer center was so much more alive actually. Sounds strange. Um, but there was an edge there. And that kind of translates to this day in some of the work that I do with people where we're really going into shadow. Some of the work I do as a galactic ambassador where I'm, I'm going into these pretty intense situations sometimes, bringing love to them. And that was what I did then. And I just burnt out from that because I really disliked the mainstream med medicine and how it handled situations. And um, Namam and Dragam was kind of my sense of it. So then I kind of took a detour into writing and I was a editor and a reporter for a while at a small business paper. And that was quite enjoyable to me. It really brought my love of words. I had taken many courses as well in creative writing. So writing was always right there for me. I kept a journal since I was like eight years old I even wrote a book in fourth grade about my parents' divorce. <clears throat> Excuse me. So writing was always a love of mine, and I always kept journals. So that's not surprising that I'm now writing every day and, and have self-published books. And um, At the business journal, I really learned how to turn a story, uh, somebody's story, into words. And I, I also was an a proofreader, so I think that serves me to this day, honestly. I learned a lot. Then I transitioned into coaching, and that just blew my world open. That was really the beginning of my awakening because this was business life coaching, the company called Emith, and it was quite progressive in terms of how it was looking at business and business owners, and it was lots of training. It was like six weeks of training this whole huge three-year program that you were offering to them. It was complicated dynamics of business owners. Um, there was a lot going on, and it was, it, was, it was a job that matched my intensity and my desire to serve. And I was a coach for about a year, and you, know, you worked with up to 25 clients, so it was pretty intense. And then I became a manager, and I was only 30 when I was offered to become a manager. So that was going into leadership early for me. And <clears throat> the main thing I learned at Hemeth was really about how to turn something into a, a, an enterprise, how to be what we called a technician, but to actually be thinking in terms of an enterprise. So this extends to this day for me in that I am a practitioner, I am a facilitator, I work with people, and yet my primary role around here in Soful Heart is what we call, we're calling it CEO, which is like CEO in the art version. And my, I have very strong visionary gifts. So I'm, I'm sort of always seeing beyond the session I'm doing I'm seeing how maybe that facilitate fits into the bigger picture. 
Did they want to be a facilitator someday? Um, what What is the bigger vision for Soulful Heart? So um, Enos really helped me with that because that's what I was coaching business owners to feel and see about their businesses because they would just get so fused. Um, and there's a lot of healers that are like that too. They It's very limited how many people they can serve. And the prices go up too. This is why a popular healer or teacher will charge, you know, sometimes up to $500, I've heard, and more for a session with them, which is way out of the price point of most people. So one of the reasons that we can keep Soulful Heart affordable in terms of sessions is because there's four of us offering it. And um, looking at it that way, really this came from my experience in Emis. And I met a man in Emis who introduced me to the group that he was working with. It was a spiritual and emotional healing group. The primary focus was parts work. So this was in 2005, I think. And I, this is what I write about in Under the Bloated Banyan quite a bit. And Mark just, that was his name, um, just opened up my world to parts. He would share with me about his parts and what was going on with them. And it, it was so intriguing to me. And there was something so intuitive about it. Um, I tell people this when I'm working with them, this parts thing, you know, you'll feel a draw or you won't. Something in you will say, I get this. This feels true to me. Or it just won't. You know, I've, I've offered parts process to a lot of people over the years. And some get it for a period of time and then move on to other things. Then there's the people who it just, whoa, just clicks. And that's how it was for me. And I attended a group. It was a monthly group for a year and a half. The process was called EBE, or Emotional Body Enlightenment. And they had a whole, a whole spiritual aspect of it that was more sagehood, sainthood, that path. But really, the focus in the beginning was on parts work and on healing the emotional body. And it's kind of similar to how we focus in Soulful Heart on the 3D self and the healing of this life wounding, the protector, the punisher, the teenager, in order to clear a lot of that anchoring to heal it. Um, and, then, and then we go into the metasoul aspects and the soul and the spiritual awakenings. So the parts awakening was huge for me to see this about parts and then witness this every month in group, you know, didn't matter how old the person was. I, I've seen an eight year old access their parts actually really easily. And I've seen an 80 year old man access his parts and to feel and see somebody, um, an engineering type, for example, drop into their inner child is amazing. And it got so real. It was like, one of the things I love the most about parts of people, when they come forward, they're real. There's, there's not the same strategy or maneuvering. I call it puppeting. When a, when a part is trying to come through a persona and not be connected with directly, it has a different energy to it. When it can just come in and talk, um, there's a realness. It's very palpable. And I would say that I'm not addicted to that realness, but it's it's how I live my life now in a more integrated way. I don't I don't have the, the big parts coming through and expression. I think you've probably noticed a pretty consistent energy from me over the time of these videos. And that, that doesn't mean I, I'm in this moment integrating a new medicinal aspect um, into my world. So I can feel her. It's kind of pressing on me a little bit. I, I asked her to sit aside during the video. Um, but it's not huge reactivity um, like it was for me in the beginning of doing parts work where the parts were just so obvious and, and so needed my love. And that eventually, just going to that monthly group eventually led to me moving to Ashland, Oregon, where the group was based, and starting to work with its founder named Daniel. And it was really connecting with Daniel in Ashland that awakened me to my God connection, my connection with the divine, which I, I had not been raised with religion. I wasn't very, I was not drawn to religion. Um, a voice in my head, I think it was my soul, said, this isn't real. 
the Bible's a fairy tale and that kind of thing. And I remember thinking this at like five years old. I've heard this from other people too. So that just wasn't my path this life. My, my metasoul's had a lot of lifetimes of devotion to the Christian God and I've felt a lot of those. But this life, it was really about awakening to a different kind of spirituality, a different, a different connection with the divine. Not goddess worship either. I've had a lot of that too. My metasoul um, has a lot of priestess frequencies in it. So what this life has been about was a personal connection with the divine. And Daniel really gifted me by seeing that. He said, ah, oh, you know, you love God so much. Your soul just loves God so much. And now it's time for you to let God love you and to have a transaction. And that really blew my world open. It, it really watered my soul and helped me see something that I'd never been able to pinpoint before. And then I really started connecting with that frequency and deepening that um, over the next few years of being in EVE. And I became a facilitator of that work, mostly working with teenagers, actually. I think this is why I'm so into the inner teenager now. That work was so enjoyable for me. I was still coaching. I had quite the great life that way. I was living in Ashland. Um, Rihanna was with me. and. I was working about 30 hours at Emith, still being a manager remotely, and also facilitating. I think at one point I had maybe nine or ten facilitants. I think it got that high, I'm not sure. Um, and then a monthly group. Um, that, though, although it was a good life, it was very stressful. And the dynamics within EBE are, were very complicated. So I can't just say to you that it was a black and white cult um, at all, but there were definitely frequencies um, and Daniel could energize some of those frequencies. Uh, really reading my book will give you a much more sense of how it played out. Um, in some ways it was kind of the standard narcissist empath situation. There were a lot of ways that Daniel saw things about me that no one ever had before and I can't imagine who else would have gifted me what he did? Um, plus, there were the part. There was the parts perspective, which I don't think I, I could have gotten any other way. It had to come to me not from a therapeutic model, which I've connected to later. Um, it needed to come through a lived-in emotional model, and it needed to be messy. So EBE was definitely a bliss mess experience. There, were, there was absolute bliss in moments and these amazing souls that were drawn to this work. So the first time I was in a spiritual community with poorest souls, and I'd never had that before, including Raphael, who I met in EBE. So there watered, watered something in me, although Daniel never wanted really a community. He was hesitant to create a community around EBE. And he had a lot of stuff around non-vulnerability and a lot of rage. And he could be so super charming and then he could be quite intense with you and mostly over email. <laughs> so that was a hard dynamic to be around. It was like you could never be comfortable. There was always an edge. After about four and a half years of that, I think I just wore out. And my, my connection with the divine was growing um, because of the parts work. I had some really good facilitators in EBE, so that's part of the modeling that I, I worked with a facilitator for almost five years. This is what I bring to my facilitants, is that all that work I did, and what I learned, um, I learned so much through coaching, managing, but also through facilitating, but also through being facilitated, and how I wanted to hold things, how I wanted to offer things, how to offer things and totally respect somebody's sovereignty and choice. All of those lessons, very valuable lessons were learned in that experience. And eventually I left TBE in a pretty intense situation. Uh, Rafael and I had just started dating about three weeks. And again, I talk more about that in my book. Um, but it also, it basically asked to leave EBE if we wanted to stay together. and. It, it really had to work out that way. I think I was really done. I was done with the system. I was done with 
uh, somebody else's process. I learned so much. And yet it was really time for me to create my own thing with Raphael. And there was a time of recovery after leaving um, because all of the people I knew in EBE were no longer talking to me. So I had Raphael and that was huge. And we were married within the, I think, six months of dating. It was just so clear to us that this was a sacred union that we'd been waiting for. Even though we didn't have any guarantees, we just fell in love so deeply. And I finally had, I like to talk about it, that I finally had enough self-worth. I had done so much work with my parts here, mated with myself, as I like to call it, so that I was finally ready for him. Even though he had brought a few attractions to me before that, before we were finally together, I just wasn't ready yet. Um, I had a couple other relationships with an EBE and it just, um, I had to work out some more shadow stuff. So when we were together, it was like the love quota just went through the roof and I no longer could sustain in the frequency that um, was being offered to me in the E. So I got very clear guidance to go. Uh, no more was the guidance. And then it was a digestion of that for a while and writing about that. And um, so wanting to offer my own thing though, and trying to do that, eventually, I think in 2010, yeah, we offered, uh, we started offering a version of Soulful Heart. And working with people primarily focused on divine mother connection and parts work. And divine mother opened out for me I, when I was Reiki attuned in 2010. I had been doing energy healing for a while. Um, I was tra trained um, by Daniel to do that. He calls it all the prana, and um, I was very. That was a that was another thing that I that he helped me see. I didn't realize I was an energy healer, or that I had such gifts for that in, in my meta soul. And then um, I wasn't sure what Reiki would offer me because I was pretty sure I didn't want to be within a system of anything. That I wanted to expand it out and let it keep growing and again, invent my own thing and create my own thing, connect to parts. So, but what Reiki gave me really was the Divine Mother. And she just popped right in uh, suddenly to my field. And I experienced her in four forms, Kuan Yin, Mother Mary, Magdalene, and then Dark Mother or Kali energy. And it, it was like I was seeing these facets of my own medicine, my own soul and getting watered by this feminine in all its different expressions. Um, and all my, my work, of course, with Daniel was led by a man. So there was still a way, there was still a patriarchal limit there. Um, but this really blew, blew the box, uh, experiencing mother this way and really feeling what does it mean to be feminine now? And it started a surrogacy with her that now I wouldn't call it a surrogacy with Mother as much as an embodiment of Mother, of Divine Feminine Frequencies, which is what we're, especially as women, is what we're all going for, is an embodiment of that. And I still, I still connect with her. It's not as, as um, intentional or deep as it used to be. Now I've got different guides. Um, but really that experience really opened out a lot for me. And, we offered Breva for about a year and a half, and then that shifted to Soulful Heart that we've been offering in some form or another since 2012. That was when Kalina came in. That's also, um, Gabriel actually did the Breva work with us, and then off and on and left, and Kalina's been off and on as well. Um, over those years, I would say the last six years, it's really been about integrating so much of what my soul, my meta soul knows and has experienced, healing the emotional body wounds through parts work, but also healing the soul wounds, meta soul karmic pieces. It's become more karmic healing for me and more meta soul healing in the last few years. And that's what I write about and keep waking up. Um, that captures a period of time at a remote ranch here in Mexico that now feels like another world. Um, we were there for a year and a half living off-grid and uh, hardly any money. 
It's just a total unplugging. And in that unplugging, I again got all of this download and I, I, I realized and remembered my galactic self. So the galactic self, which I feel like so many of us are awakening into, and working with my star seed, which is to me a healing frequency of the inner child. So I, I had been working with my inner child for many years, and then it transmuted into my star seed connected to abduction wounding, which I'm going to talk about soon. Um, so that was a huge piece of my healing and my awakening. It was awakening to the matrix and archon realities and galactic realities. This was so far beyond um, my roots, right? So I was, I was just amazed. And then guided to come back into town, Puerto Vallarta, about a year and a half ago, and then awakening to the ascension paradigm and the ascension process. So then I had a whole new language that I could, I could play and dip into and add parts work in there. And it's been about, you know, a steady, a steady year and a half now almost of serving women. And that informs a lot of what I offer now and what we offer in Soulful Heart. And I've learned a lot about um, what to call things, how to um, put, I put the process together that we use with people now um, I did that in September because I felt like we really needed a process and I wanted to offer one. And it helps with facilitators too if they have a process that they can follow. So we are now, as I sit here now, um, more and more feeling Soulful Heart as an enterprise and feeling what it can offer and the timing of what it has to offer and feeling ourselves stepping into a higher timeline of service here. And that feels connected to relocating to Glastonbury in May. Uh, I have such deep roots with Avalon in my metasoul. And so it feels like that environment supports that opening out. And that's our next phase. Um, I still have a vision for community. I see um, a Soulful Heart house, maybe it's in Glastonbury. And something about it, and it's a sanctuary for animals and people, and a retreat space for sure. And also I see Raphael and I traveling and doing retreats and seminars around the world. I say this kind of humbly because it's not, for me, I don't feel it's very self-image based. It's what, what I like to say is this is not the Joelle Lewen show. I'm not interested in becoming, um, I'm not interested in becoming seen as this really important big teacher. It's more important to me actually to serve love. And that's what I would say is the biggest awakening is coming into my capacities and embodiment of serving love here. And I can't feel any other better way to do it or any way that's just been more lined up for me than the offering of Soulful Heart and what it is and the integrity of it. Um, it. We are what we say we are. That was a piece I learned from my experiences, my previous experiences, and I, I don't have the energy to pretend to be something else. So if you came to visit, for example, or you started doing sessions, that's the same energy that we put into these, to our videos, that we put into our writing. This is how we live our life and how we live as a community. And this is a product of all of that, all of that awakening and all of the processing and all of the parts that I've worked with over the years um, and all of the work, the heart work. So thank you for taking in my story and you might want to also read the books as well and take those in. Thank you for joining me.